People often ask me how I invest my own money. This isn't so you can copy me. So whatever you do, don't copy this portfolio. It's only suitable for my risk appetite, but also my investment horizon, and also my views of the market, which may differ from yours. But why I do this is to show you how I approach investment. And I'm hoping that you may get some messages which help you construct your own portfolio. Now, I've already de-risked the equity part of my portfolio. I moved to Minimum Volatility, which is a fund that does well during periods of volatility because it captures less of the downside than it does of the upside. So as markets gyrate up and down, it tends to outperform a broader market index. But I think the story has changed slightly since I did that, and in particular in the fixed income space, for the reasons that we'll see in a moment. Now, of course, we have a membership in Pension Craft, so if you do want to join us on our Sunday evening call, or you want to join us on Slack and ask your own questions at any time, then it costs just $5 a month. I think that's brilliant value for what you get. So now let's look at my portfolio in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Although the forecasts for Q1 2020 have certainly come down, we're still only pricing in a very slight fall in earnings growth for the first quarter, which is effectively saying that earnings will be the same as last year. So that means we could have much further to fall for the US equity market if we do see earnings impacted. The reason why I cut my equity allocation from 40% to 20% was partly because of those very high valuations. As regular viewers will know, I start my allocation process with the idea of risk. And what I look for are uncorrelated assets, which is why I use this Scooby-Doo tree. Assets which are close together in the tree tend to have a high correlation. So I chopped my tree into three branches and I simply chose the funds which I liked best from each of the three branches. So I went for US dollar denominated emerging market government bonds, which made up 40% of my portfolio, 40% UK investment grade bonds, that's lending to high quality UK companies, and just 20% in a minimum volatility factor fund. Because I expected a more volatile environment and these minimum volatility funds have the nice property that they capture more of the upside than they do of the downside. But since then, we've had that very large sell-off in equity, but there have also been other developments that make me more cautious about these two fixed income or bond allocations which I've got in my portfolio. So let me explain why that's the case. But my primary concerns are about the secondary or ripple effects of the big sell-offs that we've already seen. I couldn't resist this quote from Warren Buffett when he was talking about reinsurance. He says that you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. And this kind of market dislocation is a really nice example of the tide going out. For example, there's a company called H2O Asset Management, which had just sent a letter to clients warning that its funds face surprisingly large losses. Another kind of ripple is the one that affects sovereign debt. So for example, Argentina is trying to restructure $100 billion of its foreign debt. But those negotiations have become much more difficult given the volatility that we've seen in recent days. In my video on what comes next after the equity market sell-off, I quoted this research note called Global Waves of Debt, Causes and Consequences, which suggested that currently we're seeing the peak in the fourth wave of global debt since 1970. And the article talks about the triggers which cause debt distress. So for example, when equity markets sell off and when bond spreads increase, that's a very rapid increase in risk premia. And that's exactly what we've seen over recent weeks. So far, the jump isn't sustained, but we'll have to see what happens in the weeks ahead. We've certainly seen disruptions in advanced economy financial markets and also very steep declines in commodity prices. Leading into this crisis, we saw increased trade tensions that were only partially resolved and we've yet to see a sudden deterioration in corporate debt markets in China. But I think you'll agree that we're ticking off more of these items than we'd really like to. And that's making me increasingly cautious about debt distress in emerging markets. In addition to the financial market turmoil, we've also seen a crash in the price of oil. 
Now, a very large fall in the price of oil isn't anything new. In 2014, we saw it fall from more than $100 a barrel to less than half that amount. Then it halved again in 2015, and it almost halved again in 2018. But the first episode took over 160 days, as did the second. The third took about 60 days. But what was shocking about the most recent sell-off was that it was a 30% fall in just four days. And it was a result of failure in negotiations to reduce supply and keep the price of oil high by the OPEC plus nations. That's OPEC plus Russia. Now, if you buy junk bonds in the United States, that's low quality credit, which consequently gives you a higher rate of interest, many of those bonds are issued by oil companies. And in this tweet by Eric Balchunas, who's Bloomberg's ETF guru, he takes a selection of those high yield ETFs and he shows their exposure to the energy sector. The highest exposures are around 20%. And if we look at the size of those sell-offs, we can see the ones which have the highest energy exposure have fallen the most, such as these Fallen Angel funds, which have fallen by over 7%. Whereas this high-yield ETF, which excludes oil companies, has only fallen by slightly less than 4%. So it's worth looking at the energy exposure of your funds to see if they are going to be impacted by this lower price of oil. So let's try that for the fund I own, which is the Emerging Market Government Bond ETF, managed by Vanguard. If I break down the fund by the country issuing the bonds, you can see China is by far the biggest issuer, making up 15% of the fund. So it's interesting to look at the exports of the countries in this list to see how much they depend on exports of oil. And what's worrying is that many of them actually do depend heavily on oil exports, as you can see in this global breakdown for 2017. Drilling into the individual countries, you can see that Indonesia, although it does depend heavily on exports of commodities, petroleum products don't make up a very large proportion of those exports. Whereas for Saudi Arabia, obviously they're much more important. For Brazil, in total, it's about 7 or 8% of its exports. And of course, it's much higher for the United Arab Emirates. And also for Russia and Qatar. But it's certainly not true of all the countries. So, for example, South Korea, Turkey and Mexico will not see their exports negatively impacted by the fall in the price of oil. For my UK investment grade bond fund, my worry is more about the credit quality of companies. Now, the reason why I chose an investment grade fund was that I didn't want to take low quality credit exposure. The credit world is sliced into two groups. Above this line, where the ratings are triple B or higher, so single A, double A, or even triple A, is known as investment grade. And the UK credit market is almost completely investment grade. If the credit rating is double B or lower, so that's single B, triple C, double C, or single C, then that's called speculative credit, or junk bonds. We've already seen that asset class has sold off considerably as people's risk appetite falls. If we look at my fund on the Morningstar website, it has a really useful credit quality breakdown, which shows what proportion of the bonds in the fund have each credit rating. And although it's reassuring to see about a fifth of them are AAA, I am concerned because almost 40% of the bonds are the lowest credit quality for investment grade, and that's B. That's easier to see if you look at this pie chart. So the B bonds are the ones shown in green. Now, the UK market for credit isn't looking too leveraged. The trouble with a credit market across the world is that it's highly correlated. So here you can see the default rates by region since the year 2000, with data from S&P Global Ratings. Notice how when one of the regions spikes, all of the rest of them spike as well. So that happened in 2001, and then again during the global financial crisis. So a credit issue in one country could easily spill over into the UK. And this fund is by no means unusual. Because interest rates have been so low, a huge amount of debt has been issued at the triple B level. The amount of triple B debt globally is almost $4 trillion. And triple B debt makes up almost a third of global corporate bonds. And the proportion of investment grade debt, which is triple B, has been steadily increasing from 1990, such that currently it makes up about a half of all investment grade bonds. Now, one yardstick that credit strategists use to look at the quality of newly issued bonds is the proportion 
which is junk, compared to the total amount which is issued. And during fairly benign times of good economic growth, that usually goes above 20%. And that's the scale on the left-hand side. And it was above that level of junk for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. And then we got a big shakeout and a spike in default rates as the credit bubble popped. Then we got another seven year period, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the credit bubble popped again around the year 2000. Then we had five years of brisk junk bond issuance in 2003, four, five, six, seven, and then we had the global financial crisis. But since then, we've had an incredibly long period without a spike in default rates. In fact, it's been a 10 year period without having a big shake of the credit tree. Now, if we do get a sharp downturn in growth and a weakening of consumer demand, then some of that triple B rated debt could be downgraded to junk. If that happens, then any investment grade funds would be forced to sell those bonds because it's not in their remit to own junk. That would amplify the financial market effects of the initial downturn because it would increase the cost of funding in the credit market and that would cause more companies to go into distress and then we'd get a downward spiral in the credit market. If it's anything like 2009, then we could see a quarter of a trillion dollars of debt downgraded to junk and that would be within the space of just one year. If it's more of a short sharp shock then we may avoid this kind of outcome. If it's more longer lived then this could be a real threat to the credit market. And just like the equity market although we have seen the spreads which price in the risk of default increase it's still nothing like the scale of what happened during the global financial crisis. So currently we're still pricing in a fairly benign credit scenario. And this is why I'm getting more concerned about the UK investment grade credit market. So I've decided to sell my UK investment grade credit and replace it with UK government bonds. So I'm going to make two changes to my portfolio. The first one is to switch my UK investment grade bonds into UK government bonds. And the second is to switch my US dollar denominated emerging market government bonds into US treasuries. So I'll use the switch tool and I'll use units and I'm going to switch that into UK long duration gilts and into sterling hedged US government bonds and the split will be 50-50. So I've now got two pending trades to sell my emerging market government bonds and my UK investment grade bonds and to buy US government bonds, sterling hedged and UK long duration gilts. So now my portfolio is even more cautious because the fixed income side is taking no credit risk. It's just government bonds issued by the UK government and the US government and I've sacrificed return in order to protect my capital. Remember, if you do want to keep abreast of what's going on in markets, we produce a free weekly market roundup. You'll find a link at the top of this page, so it's very easy to sign up. And as always, thank you for listening.